it's very good to be here at Imperial. Um, I must say, in the last too many years I've been at the Lancet, I haven't been to Imperial as much as I should have done or would have liked to have done. But I must say, um, since Peter's come here, and you know, London is very lucky to have Peter. Um, I know that he had uh, many offers to go around the world, particularly to some extraordinarily uh, prestigious institutions in the United States. And I think Imperial did well to catch him. Just needs to keep him now. Um, I want to, first of all, apologize uh, for all the rude things I've ever said about UN AIDS um, in front of you. Uh, um, they, they, they weren't meant, of course. Um, and it's really good. I hope we can forge a very close relationship now that you're here. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit. Um, it, the next 40 minutes or so is very personal. Um, it's my kind of therapy in global health. It's uh, my talking cure, in a way. Um, because as we've got more interested in global health issues, we found ourselves entangled in more and more complicated problems, much more complicated, actually, from a, I mean, a moral as well as a scientific point of view than anything we've ever um, encountered in our usual beat, which is clinical medicine. So I want to, I want to reflect on some of those, those questions. Um, but before I do that, I, I need to say a little bit about how The Lancet, one medical journal, has come to have a view and, a, and, a, and an interest and a participation in this thing we call global health. Because we can't divorce our interest and your interest too um, we can't divorce that commitment from where we are. We are at a particular moment in time and place, and that historical instance determines our perspective on the rest of the planet. It determines our biases about the way we look at the world. If we were based in Delhi, or Beijing, or Rio, or Cairo, or Harare, we would have a completely different view on many of the issues that we call global health. And indeed, you travel to those cities and they do have a very different view about many of the issues that, that we are interested in as well. And so we have to take account of our, if you like, perspectivism. And one of the questions I want to ask you right at the beginning as, as, you, as, as we go into the next 40 minutes or so is to ask, should we simply accept our perspective. We're mostly, but not exclusively, but mostly a London-based medical publication. You are mostly a London-based academic institution. Should we accept our perspective from here with all of the advantages and disadvantages that has? Or should we try and change our perspective? Should we try and change our personality to look at the problems that face us with different points of view. It's a question that occupies my mind pretty much every day because we are bombarded with research, opinions, ideas from around the planet which force us to rethink some of our assumptions. And we don't get it right much of the time and we make mistakes in our assumptions and the question that I have to ask myself is, how much of that can we take? The Lancet, as Chris Murray always tells me, is too powerful in the arena of global health. And if that's correct, that you occupy a position in terms of publication that has, has the risk of biasing a debate, and some of the issues I'll raise, I think, point to how we could be biasing the, the, the debate, then we should ask ourselves what we do about that if we do anything. So let me start off. The modern era of global health. I look back, I joined the Lancet in uh, 1990, and I really didn't know anything about global health at that time. I was on a career track to know a great deal about the liver. Uh, and uh, that was, it's the most beautiful organ in the body without question, um, but this was a long time ago. And when I first came to The Lancet, we were being hit with the beginnings of what became the global dimension of HIV AIDS. 
Peter and colleagues wrote a piece in The Lancet back in July last year reviewing the first 30 years of the HIV AIDS pandemic. And one of the first things that he states is how we underestimated for too long the global impact of the epidemic. If I look back at the coverage that we have of what was global medicine back in the early 90s, it was HIV AIDS which began to change the nature of the way we saw the world. And this is still a very important lesson. It's, it's very easy to think that AIDS is solved now. Test and treat, that's the answer. If we just do enough testing, we do enough treating, then the model says, if you believe the model, we can extinguish AIDS. But that's not right. We're still not spending enough on HIV AIDS. We still have to encounter epidemics of stigma and discrimination. There is an unfinished agenda to do with HIV AIDS, and it remains an enormous both motivating force for those of us who are interested in global medicine, but also an enormous predicament that has yet to be addressed sufficiently. And this shadow of the epidemic still hangs over us, although some would argue it doesn't. And this is one of the issues I want to um, pick up in a moment. So for our, from our point of view, where we sat in London, the beginnings of the 90s started to be informed by the impact of AIDS. It's also important not to underestimate what it felt like to be in a country that was, at least peripherally, but still importantly, connected to a continent of Europe where there was a war taking place. I still remember vividly taking a car and driving into Vukovar in the mid-90s to see a town literally raised to the ground. Virtually the only building that still remained in that town was a hospital and a dialysis unit which had continued somehow to survive while the rest of Vukovar had been destroyed. And it's, it seems trite to say it, but to think that you could go to a country which was a tourist destination for many people in Europe and see the way those lands had been torn apart and the savagery that had taken place where at one hospital in Bos Bosnia, Herzegovina, patients who were in hospital had been rounded up and taken out of that hospital, massacred in a nearby field, buried in shallow graves. And to see that take place, the intersection between medicine and politics in the most incredibly violent setting on our own continent had a huge impact on us at the Lancet. It made us realize that the breadth in which we were operating at that time was simply too narrow. It just wasn't good enough to just publish lots of randomized trials. We had to do something else. The question really was, what else were we to do? The events that took place in New York were also an important determinant on the way we looked at the world, in a very strange way, actually. And in a way that was, for whatever one's political biases are, perhaps counterintuitive. Because one of the upshots of September the 11th was a national security strategy written by the Bush administration which underlined the importance of global health. Now, we can all be critical of many dimensions of that government. But what was very interesting was, if you read the national security strategy, there was, a, there was an instrumentalist view about the role that development and global health could play in protecting American domestic security. And of course, one could look at that with a cynical eye, but actually what America did, as we know, was to create PEPFAR, and who could have believed that it would have taken a Republican administration to create 
one of the most powerful instruments in global health that we have today. Many problems with it, many flaws about it, but nevertheless, it exists. And it can be traced back to this event, at least in large part. At that time, though we were seeing the politics of global medicine changing, and the importance of leadership in trying to take us out of what were becoming seemingly intractable predicaments. Gru Harlan Brundtland, who became Director General of WHO in 1998, a former Prime Minister of Norway, led the Brundtland Commission on Sustainable Development, a very high-level political figure, and really took WHO into a stratosphere that it had not occupied on the global political stage. And that important moment of escalated leadership gave health a position in politics, which, unfortunately, since then at WHO, it has lost. And it has lost dramatically, increasingly, and concerningly. And what we did, and this is the right-hand side of the slide, a group of people put together to try and raise the question about how do we select leaders of our global institutions. I mean, it was an utter failure because we weren't able to do anything to change the way leaders have been selected. But even this year, we have seen a catastrophic mistake in the way we choose the leader of UNICEF. We have a moment where Anne Veneman, a former agriculture minister in the Bush administration, leaves UNICEF at the end of the first term, and a, a wonderful moment for the Obama administration to select somebody who actually knew something about child health. And instead, they chose Anthony Lake, who, who although he was a board member of UNICEF, carries no technical or psychological leadership of the child health community, which actually is a very important technical requirement to see UNICEF build the right policies in the right way, as I'll show in a few moments. Editors were waking up to the fact that we needed to think about the world differently. And in the mid-90s, two wonderful editors at the, at the Annals of Internal Medicine, Bob and Suzanne Fletcher, decided that we needed to create a World Association of Medical Editors where we looked at the obstacles and challenges confronting editors worldwide. Editors were part of a global community, and we'd never seen ourselves as part of a global community before. And we asked ourselves, I think for the first time, those journals who occupy positions in North America and continental Europe, what really is our purpose? Why are we here? Who is our audience? What is our future? And the Lancet tried in rewriting its terms of engagement about what it published. There was the stuff about randomized trials, very important stuff about epidemiology. But we try to be committed to global health and health policy. And we said this way back in 2000. The problem for me was, though, and I think this is the problem for Jeff Drazen at the New England Journal of Medicine. It's the problem for Kathy DeAngelis at JAMA. It's the problem for many journals that you might consider for publication. The problem is we're at a particular point and we're stuck. And we don't know how to get out of our traditional perspective. We need help. We need to be led out of a cul-de-sac which we've put ourselves in for the last 150 years. For me, the man who took me out of a dark place was this man, Eldred Parry, who'd spent a large part of his life working in Africa, in Ethiopia, in Nigeria, in Ghana. One of the authors on this phenomenon, I mean, you can see it in two dimensions. If you saw it in three dimensions, is this enormously thick textbook. Um, and he rang me up one day. Um, I'd never met him before. And he said, Richard, we never met. 
you need to go to Africa. Uh, okay, um, I hadn't thought about needing to go to Africa at that time. I think my life was dominated by impact factor. And he, we went off, and we went, our first visit, to Ethiopia. And he took me to Jimma, uh, Jimma University uh, in the southern part of Ethiopia, where we went out and visited some of the research collaborations that he and his colleagues at the Tropical Health and Education Trust were funding, and met students there, looked at how a university was trying to, in this region of Ethiopia, change the way health was seen as part of the social and political fabric of the country. He also, shortly after that, took me to Ghana. And this is where the beginnings of understanding for a medical journal, the importance of introducing politics into the space of medicine really hit home for me. At that time in Ghana, it was not clear that the transition to multi-party democracy was going to succeed. And when Eldred took me to Ghana, there was an election that was taking place. And here's one of the... Um, we haven't changed over here. This is the kind of election <laughs> stuff we see here. He won the election. And um, he, perhaps more than many other political leaders, enabled that stable transition to take place, which has provided a foundation for Ghana, which remains incredibly important for its development. And we, we went to uh, villages to see the impact of traditional birth attendance in relation to maternal newborn child health, community health workers, and, and I'm sure Jeff and Kathy at other journals would say this, you know, when you get taken somewhere and you see the world from a different place with a different perspective, it changes the direction that your life takes and changes the direction that your journal takes in this particular case. And this is why I say it's this anxiety of perspective about which direction do we go? Are we trying to be all things to all people? And at an institution like this, which direction do you go? This phrase, global university, is used a lot these days. And one university in London actually has it, of course, in its, in its kind of tagline. But what does it mean to call yourself a global university? What does it mean to call yourself a medical journal that's interested in global health? So at that point, I was asking myself, well, are we a mirror of medicine? Or should we be a bit more active in the way we engage with some of these issues? And the person who answered that question for me was this remarkable woman called Jennifer Bryce. Jennifer uh, has worked at WHO and UNICEF in the past, and she came to see us to say, what are you doing about child survival? And the answer was, we weren't doing anything about ch child survival because we didn't know anything about child survival. And she put together a group of scientists that looked at where children were dying in the world, and this was the map from the first paper showing where children were dying in the world, and she linked this fairly standard, in one way, epidemiological analysis to a very strong political message, a political message that said that the agencies and governments who are supposed to have stewardship responsibility for children were failing, and they were failing badly. So this was back in 2003. And since then, we've worked with many scientists and some people in this audience to produce this whole series of reports that have looked at some of these aspects of global health. But these reports have actually raised more questions than they've answered. And they're questions that now trouble me. And I don't know how to proceed with them. I've got eight questions that I want to talk about. The first question is, are we scientists or are we activists? There is a tension between science and advocacy. And how do we navigate that tension? 
In March, we published a paper which comes from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation in Seattle, led by Chris Murray's team. And it was a paper that had a very important result. Because for the last 20 years, the Safe Motherhood movement has been a very powerful advocate on behalf of maternal health and has taken the lead on MDG5, which is reducing maternal mortality. But the UN estimates on maternal mortality have stayed constant at 500,000 or so for 20 years. So it looks like we've been pouring good money after bad. Fantastic advocacy, utter failure. But this was a very powerful advocacy message for the maternal health community because what they could say is we need more money because we're not making a difference in countries. This year is a very important year. Obviously, we've got the UN General Assembly in September, replenishment funds for the Global Fund and for Gavi. Critical to get that money into those funds if they're going to continue to do their work. And a great discussion right now about whether the Global Fund should expand its mandate from MDG6, HIV, AIDS, TB, malaria, to MDG4, child survival, and MDG5, maternal health. And here, here, for the first time, it looks that, like since 1980, there has been a gradual improvement in overall maternal mortality, which is a fantastically encouraging result. And indeed, what this also shows, importantly, is the intimate connection, which really hadn't come out before, between maternal mortality and HIV. And to separate out HIV into MDG6 and, and maternal health into MG, MDG5, to report them separately, to have programs and funding and political messages that were totally separate, and countries signing up to a particular MDG because they saw a window of, of, of opportunity there. Norway done a, has done a great job at MDG 4 and 5, but it chose those two because it saw everybody else in MDG 6. But this is a completely fallacious way to look at the biology and public health dimensions of these conditions. So, the idea that perhaps we should be looking at a common fund for the health-related MDGs and other health-related global health issues was important. However, however, good news is not what was wanted. The maternal health advocacy com community did not want this paper published. At least they didn't want it published now. So I got a whole slew of emails from people saying, please don't publish this paper. Here's one of them. A couple of requests to see if The Lancet would consider holding publication of Chris's paper until the paper on the UN estimates is ready in September. So we were being asked to wait six months until the UN had got its act together, and then we could go out and publish this paper. And of course, September is the UN General Assembly meeting, and there are some big meetings taking place between now and then, including the G8 and G20 in Canada. So we would keep this good news from the public, from policymakers and politicians. We wouldn't give it to them while we could still say over 500,000 women are dying during pregnancy. Now that kind of manipulative deception that we were being asked to collude with is one of the dimensions of modern global health. And the relation between science and activism is leading to perverse behaviors that actually undermine, in my view, and certainly the view of the authors of this paper, the impact that science can actually have on policy. We need big numbers to make our advocacy cases. If our numbers go down, our advocacy message weakens. Therefore, please do something not to let these numbers get out just yet. Scientists, too, colluded with this message. And some of the emails I had came from highly respected scientists in this country as well as elsewhere. Second question. Should ethics 
determine our engagement with countries. Peter mentioned, I came back yesterday afternoon from Beijing, where we launched our second theme issue on China. And it was, a, it was, it was good. It was a, it, we, we had a fantastic relationship with the Ministry of Health. Um, we had people from party officials come to give speeches, welcoming this. And at one level, it felt good. It felt like we were participating in a collaboration that was worthwhile. The Lancet also has a China issue that comes out every month, translated into Chinese, where a local editor selects material from the journal and um, writes an accompanying comment with it. We wanted to translate our China theme issue, but we were told that there were two pieces in that theme issue that we couldn't translate. Two papers that have to be given up for translation because they're politically sensitive and the media is under strict supervision. I was only allowed to go for seven days to China because I'm media and that's not good. Uh, now, what should we be doing? Google pulled out because they made a calculation that the principles of the way they run their business had to be such that ethics was put before engagement. We have judged that it's better to work with a Ministry of Health that is trying to do something very interesting in terms of expanding social insurance across the country. It's better to be there working with them than outside. But is that right? Because if that is right, then we are going to have more instances of where material that we publish, we have to accept, is not going to appear in local media. And are we betraying a very important principle? And if you, and I don't know about Imperial, what work you do in China, but you would face exactly the same challenge. How much compromise can we allow before we have betrayed many of the ideas that we would regard as central to academic freedom. Are these ideas and principles simply there to be traded? Should we criticize our friends? The global health community feels big sometimes, but it's actually quite small. And we all know the problems within it. We gossip about it all the time. We know who are the good guys. We know who are the bad guys. The danger is if you go out and say that in public, then you risk that the enemies of those who would want to see money going into aid, development budgets, health, would use that against us. So how much of the discussion we all have should be in the public domain? And so should we accept certain forces, biases, influences, and not challenge them? Because to do so could actually end up harming the very cause that we believe in. An obvious one relates to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which has become such a dominant force in global health. And Dave McCoy and his colleagues published a paper last year looking at at a very top level, at funding flows from the foundation. There were several messages that came out of that. One was obviously the focus on technology, but that's fine. Another was that the investments that the foundation make are not evenly distributed according to burden of disease. That's a bias that could be adverse. But perhaps most imp importantly, the allegation was, and the foundation came back strongly about this, but the allegation was that when you looked at the funding flows, they all went to Johns Hopkins, London School of Hygiene, and places like that. They were not building up capacity in the places where capacity needed to be builded up. Jim is in the audience, and I would single out Jimmy and his work at the Wellcome Trust, because the Wellcome Trust has taken a radically different perspective on this. 
a different philosophy which is all about building up local capacity, where local capacity is so desperately needed. But, but, I was summoned to meet this man who wrote in The Lancet after we published this paper, we welcome diverse viewpoints about global health strategy and grant making. Now, and Tachimata, at, you know, that's, I totally believe that statement. Except, um, I was ushered into a, a, a seminar room in Seattle with him and um, Joe Sorrell. Joe's not here, is he? No. He's actually now the London representative of um, the Gates Foundation. And I was severely told off for A, publishing this paper, and B, questioning the motives of the foundation. Indeed, Tachi said, you know, it really isn't the place of a medical journal to raise questions like this. You should be publishing science. It's not your job to try and orchestrate a discussion about our strategy and about our role. So Tachi, where should that take place? He wasn't sure at first, and he said it should take place on our website. <laughs> now, but he has, a, he has an important point, and it is the extent to which we hold one another accountable in public and whether we harm ourselves by doing so. And his view was very much, and I, I've never had a letter from Bill Gates in my life, but I do have one letter from Bill Gates, a very cross letter, where he says... You're just wrong, wrong, wrong. And these issues are very unhelpfully raised by you. And clearly the view is we shouldn't be raising them. Do we care more about power or do we care about people? Let me come back to our friends at UNICEF. When Anne Veneman was made executive director, I think the title is. She gave a speech in Geneva at the World Health Assembly, which I attended, where she said some very positive things about the work that UNICEF was doing, particularly around something called the Accelerated Child Survival and Development Program. She said this in 2005. We can report that in just three years, the dramatically increased coverage of these high-impact interventions is estimated to reduce child deaths by 20%, across a range of countries and settings. Yes! This is just the kind of news we needed because now it provided the authority to roll these programs, programs out across, in particular, sub-Saharan Africa. It was never quite clear what these figures, where they come from, what their provenance was. To give credit to UNICEF, after this speech was made and after they were implementing this program, they then asked Jennifer Bryce and her colleagues at Hopkins to do an evaluation. It made not one jot of difference. When this paper was published in January this year, UNICEF put out a statement saying exactly the opposite of what the paper said. It, it, was, it was Orwellian in its inability to address the issues that the paper was addressing. It was as if they were answering a completely different question. And again, it is this issue of how accountable are global institutions in health to evidence, to science, to data. And often the answer is they're not accountable at all because the politics of health are such that they can't afford to be accountable. And this will lead on to another question in a minute. So is good news the only acceptable kind of news that we can have? Because the politics of global health is such that we can't admit our failures, because we're so existentially anxious about our position in the political sphere of the planet that to raise these issues of potential bad news would do more harm than good. Imperial hosted, Peter hosted, and thank you for doing so, a seminar a few weeks ago on another paper that came out of Seattle from Chris Murray's group, looking at the concept of additionality. What happens to the aid that is tagged with a health label that goes into countries? 
Well, first of all, the good news. The good news is that you can see aid budgets, and these are measured according to government and IMF data, government and IMF data, from 1995 to 2006. You can see that these health expenditures from the government have been going up. That's a tremendously positive message. Governments are responding to demands for better health action. The downside of this is that when you look at where the aid goes, it doesn't always go into health. And so the moral question that's posed is, should we as a donor, a big donor, when we give money to a country that has a health tag to it, should we insist that that money is for health? It's a conditionality of the aid that it should be for health. Or do we say, you know, actually, it's your choice. You spend the money how you see fit. You know how this money should be spent better than we do. If you want to take some of this money that's tagged health and spend it on education, then do it. Which position should we take as a, as a donor? Now, this was interpreted as deeply bad news. And last year, when these data were presented at a conference, again, I was taken aside by somebody, uh, a senior figure at the sponsoring organization for this research, and I was told, Richard, it would not be helpful to publish this paper. The world right now doesn't need this news. We are desperate in a moment of global financial crisis to secure our aid budgets. We need money going into health. If you publish a paper that says this money that's going into health isn't going into health, you will reduce the motivation of political leaders to spend money on health. So please don't do it. There is some merit to at least discussing that argument. And at the meeting that Peter hosted, some of these messages came out in slightly softer tones. But there is an important question here about the way we present good or bad news in global health. And what is our responsibility for spreading that news? So when you look at this whole landscape, who on earth runs global health today? Where is the power? Who has the control? Who makes the decisions? Last year, we got ourselves into a bit of trouble. Um, and I completely confess, I probably made some bad judgments about the way I presented this work. It was work that had the rather uninviting label of positive synergies. My almost favorite word to hate is synergies, because it's used at the Lancet, all, all, our publishers all the time. And, but the question is this. Is money that's going into vertical programs doing all good, or is it doing any harm? And there was some evidence that, of course, lots of evidence is doing good, but also evidence that the effects of global health initiatives on, for example, access and uptake of non-targeted health service, services, so services outside of the immediate purview of that global health initiative, show positive and also negative effects. We got slammed for raising this question in an editorial and saying that organizations like Gavi, the Global Fund, the World Bank, governments, were undermining the broad health mission of the only intergovernmental organization amongst all of these, the only organization that at least makes an attempt to represent a global democracy, and that is WHO. And at the meeting where this was presented, this report was presented, a report about countries mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. The meeting was held in a hotel in Venice. So go figure. Something, another question you could raise about global health. At that meeting, two individuals who have a very prominent role in some of these global health initiatives, who are quite tall, surrounded Margaret Chan, Director General of WHO, who isn't. And they were both men. And I mean, harassment, bullying, easy labels to throw on people. But to me as an outsider watching it, it looked pretty close to that. 
Uh, there's very little harmony in global health. And there's a lot of competition about who runs global health. A lot of harmful competition that the H8, which is supposedly this harmonious group, it doesn't stand for harmony, it stands for health. Um, this group that is supposed to coordinate global health um, doesn't really get over. You might ask, for example, in a group that's supposed to coordinate global health, and you've got UN agencies, major global health initiatives, why is it that a private sector dominated foundation has a place at the table? Why not Imperial? Why not University College? Why not the London School of Hygiene? Why not whoever? <laughs> you. But why the Gates Foundation? Because, you know, rather, again, a rather obvious comment to make because money has, if you have the money, you have the voice and you get invited to the table. Is that the way we want to run? what we would see as our community, because that's the way it's run now. So, what are we? Let me come back to science and activism, because we probably get it wrong sometimes, and uh, we got it wrong over positive synergies, probably, and we probably got it wrong in relation to climate change. We published a report from the London School of Hygiene in December last year, looking at the, if you intervened, on climate change, what would be the health co-benefits? If you did all the things that you're supposed to do in terms of mitigation, then would this have any beneficial effects on health? The answer was massive, massive, and you could measure them, or at least you could model them. And that might be the same thing. Mark Wolpert at the end got up and he said, you know, I was being polemical. This isn't about advocacy. We're letting advocacy contaminate the science. And I thought, this is ridiculous. Please, come on, you know, get real. We should, be about, we should be taking our research data and taking it to the front lines and using it to fight a war. And then the events at the University of East Anglia happened and the Climate Research Unit. And I thought to myself, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Because when you look, I don't know if you've looked at the House of Commons Select Committee report at what took place at the University of East Anglia or whether you've looked at the Oxborough report or you've followed this in any detail, but if you actually look at what happened there, there was this intersection again of extremely well-meant advocacy around climate change, but which shaded into views that were expressed which could easily be misinterpreted and indeed have been misinterpreted or at least interpreted as very damaging to the whole argument about climate change. So have we gone too far? So the last question is, what is the future for global health? And I want to very quickly run through some potential futures. If you like, coordinates for global health as we see them at one journal. And again to say, these are coordinates that come at us from where we sit. But please tell me if we need to have a different set of coordinates. Violence. It's not a, we don't think of violence as a global health issue sometimes. But if you actually go to places where there has been a lot of violence, it certainly is an issue of health. This is a picture taken uh, just outside of Gaza City. I was there in March. You manage to get permits to go through the Kalandia checkpoint. And this is a man who is doing something both dignified and enormously sad. He's rebuilding his house because his house was destroyed in the Gaza attacks of last year. And he has two piles of uh, paving stones of, of from his old house. This is the pile that he's cut up from the destroyed floor of his house. And he is knocking off the bits of concrete around those paving stones and having tidied them up, putting them in this pile here. This is the house that he is trying to build. And over on this side, there is a tent that he and his family are living in. He took me inside his house where he is now having to use the materials from his destroyed house and rebuild his own home. 
He can't get building materials because building materials aren't allowed through the Calandia checkpoint. I make no political point. I'm just describing the facts as they are on the ground for people living there. His son is mixing concrete in the, at the front of his house, and that concrete, they are getting some bags of concrete from USAID through, but literally they have about six bags that were sitting in the front part of the house, so very little. He's using that to try and build walls in his house. But violence isn't just direct violence, destroying people's homes, destroying people's health systems. There's also an indirect consequence of violence, a structural violence. So if you look at the Middle East right now, and you look at the deaths per 100 live birds, and you look at two time points, 1990 at the end here, and 2005 here. So in Egypt, in 1990, that was the child mortality for under fives. And then in 2005, it had reduced to here. So some very significant reductions in child mortality across the Eastern Mediterranean region. The lowest reduction in child mortality in the occupied Palestinian territory. And if you go there, you know, this is a very um, well-developed uh, institution. It has Bizet University, which is not much different to Imperial College, uh, sitting on the hillside. But the structural effects of the violence that they live under is having indirectly direct effects on health. Violence and also justice. Amartya Sen's book, The Idea of Justice, there are few non-neighbors left in the world today. It should be clear how central the role of public reasoning is in the understanding of justice. So we all have a role here in achieving some kind of social justice. But there is a counter view, and the counter view has been well put by Thomas Nagel in 2005, that the full standards of justice apply only within the boundaries of, of a sovereign state. Implies that those of us who are interested in global health have to be deeply modest about what we can achieve. And that modesty perhaps should inform the way we discuss global health issues beyond the immediate technical dimension of what it is we are concerned with. Because change is only going to come from within countries. It's not going to come because of you or I. So this aspiration to justice needs to be tempered with a realization of the limits of justice. But it still should be a domain of our concern. It is impossible to exclude politics from health although we get very severely criticized for doing so. And it's a very difficult line to tread. This slide is taken from a forthcoming series we're launching at the World Health Assembly in a few weeks on tuberculosis. And when you look from 2002 to 2010, we can see that the political traction from organizations like the Global Fund has led to a massive increase in funding for TB, which is immensely important and valuable. But here, and here's a horrible slide, and I apologize. This is looking at MDGs, one, two, three, four, five, six, for South Africa. And all you need to look at is the colors. You don't need to look at anything else. Because for one, for four, for five, so child, maternal, they are red because there's insufficient progress. And a lot of that has had to do, unfortunately, with the political context in which health is being applied in a country. How? Should we, what should be our role, if any, in trying to shape the political environment in which health um, operates? I think we do have a role, but I've shown, I think, some of the complications and entanglements we can get into when we do take that role. Gender is insufficiently discussed in global health. It is not a mainstream issue, and it should be center stage. The notion of women as mothers still dominates the discussion around maternal health. We haven't even got to women as individuals. We haven't got to women as family members or women as citizens. We're still stuck in a conception of women that sees women as containers for children. I've taken the next quote from The Guardian from a couple of weeks ago, because in a way, the notion of cultural femicide, it's a very extreme statement. But the idea is the erasure of women from the political space in which we discuss global health. 
Certainly when I go to global health meetings, women are erased from that discussion. It is a technical discussion, and the role of women in that conception of health is simply not an issue. It's not even on the agenda. The role of the university is also something for you and I to consider. And it's something that is occupying my mind a lot at the moment, and I'll explain why in a minute. There is a view that universities should be centers for disinterested inquiry. And Kenneth Minogue, a noted right of center academic, put it this way, universities are not devoted to the improvements of the world, and their attention is remote from the urgencies moving men, this was written in the 1970s, in day-to-day -day endeavor. So should we be cautious about applying universities to some of our social predicaments? You recognize that guy on the right. It's a, I've never seen you look so smart in my life. <laughs> We've started these things called commissions, where we are trying to explore how science can link with policy in the political space. And the first one we did was re related to climate change, and we did it with UCL. And Peter is leading one for us on technology and global health that we hope to publish next year. And we're having the first meeting in a few weeks to discuss that. The university surely should have a role a political and social role in shaping the environment for health. But it needs a strategy to do that. And most universities do not have strategies to think about their social purpose, their social accountability, and yet it should be a mainstream issue for them. We need to think about cooperation and what cooperation means. Back in 2008, we wrote something about what we call global health tracking, monitoring and evaluating programs in global health. And the aim was to look at how we broaden the focus of monitoring from agency, i.e. the UN, to peer-reviewed scientific journals, like the additionality paper I showed you, like the maternal mortality paper I showed you. But we have a lot of tension around independent science conflicting with UN agendas. One concerned scientist wrote this in an email to me recently about a research group that is doing this independent monitoring. The groups have felt abused. These are groups often within the United Nations. Not respected, nothing shared, arrogant and ultimately self-destructive behavior. So cooperation in global health is hard. And there are many barriers to collaboration. We've tried to have collaboration here. There's the Lancet with a whole bunch of organizations in the child survival space. But we've got problems. Institutions are underfunded. Institutions have conflicts of interest. Global health still has a very low academic status in most health institutions. It's hard to replicate studies, and there's a risk to decision makers of investing in something like global health, because for a university, it's not going to bring in as much money as if you get a randomized trial funded by Pfizer. We're part of the media, and we should ask ourselves, what is the future of development journalism? If you look at the number of geotag wiki articles per country, you can see that the space of the internet is incredibly dominated by certain parts of the world, and other parts of the world are almost completely absent from our global conversation. How do we change the way the world discusses its future? And then the last point is this, education. What is the role of education? People are the most precious resource we have for the future of health. But we have paid almost no attention at all to the education of health professionals in that future. The attention has been almost exclusively on research. When we do talk about education, it's primary education, not university or college-based education. And we have a commission that's actually being chaired by Julio Frank and Lincoln Chen looking at a vision and recommending specific actions for the transformation of health professional education. We just had a meeting uh, this week to talk about that commission. We hope to launch it in November this year. Trying to alter the trajectory of education because there are different health threats. Global health initiatives are having a hugely beneficial impact largely but how do we sustain them? Without educated professionals, they won't be sustained. We have very old-fashioned views about professionalism. 
We need to accelerate educational initiatives in low middle income countries and we don't discuss this nearly enough in when, we, when we think about global health. Last two slides. This talk is labeled the decrees of fate and the phrase decrees of fate comes from a book, the Mahabharata. And the idea is that actually we're very weak people. Fate will take us in a direction and we have very little say over where fate will take us. We cannot change the circumstances that destiny decrees, the decrees of fate. And we should be very humble about thinking what we can truly achieve. And in the Mahabharata there is a discussion, a debate that takes place between two individuals, Draupadi and Yudhishthira. Draupadi says this, excessive tolerance is responsible for the calamity that has befallen you. And her argument is, you just sit around talking all the time, for God's sake, do something. Tolerating this injustice is not acceptable. You've abandoned your responsibility. And that's how it feels sometimes in global health. Yudhishthira said something different. He said, I do what seems to be right only because it is the only way and not for results. And here is a tension. We feel this immense, immense emergency right in front of us that we must act now to do something about it. But the danger is, and I've given some examples here, that in our rush to act, in our urgency, in our commitment, in our advocacy, we do not do what is right. We often do things that have unanticipated harmful consequences. And so for the future of global health, for the way you and I interact in coming years. We have to balance a feeling of emergency and an urgency of action and temper that with recognizing our humility, our weakness and our mistakes and constantly reflecting on those errors and thinking about how we can do better. And the answer to the future of global health lies in the way we have this discussion over the next few years. Thank you very much.